In episode 42, we saw that experimental results over a period of many years showed the Earth to be stationary at the centre of the universe. Michelson and Morley's experiment was particularly embarrassing and unwelcome to the scientific establishment. A search began for a way to explain away the lack of movement of the Earth through space. The first to come up with an explanation was the Irish physicist George Francis Fitzgerald. His solution was that the pressure of the ether against the interferometer must have squashed the arm pointing in the direction of the motion, just enough to cancel out the fringe shift. The Dutch physicist Hendrik Anton Lorentz picked up this idea and ran with it to create a theory of relativity which had mass, length and time all jumbled together, so not only lengths were squashed by the ether, but clocks slowed down and mass increased as well. The ether and its properties were the foundation of the theory. To the relief and joy of scientists everywhere, Relativity explained away Michelson and Morley's lack of movement of the Earth. Until Kennedy and Thorndike in America built an interferometer with arms of different length. The squashing of the arm in the direction of motion should now lead to a reduced size fringe shift. But there was no fringe shift at all. The Earth was back to standing still, and even Lorenz's relativity couldn't get it moving again. But as often happens, mathematics came to the rescue. Mathematics can be the most powerful tool in a scientist's toolkit. Mathematics is the language most suited to accurately describe the relationships observed in experiments and interpreted by theories. Results from new, critical experiments can be tested to see if they agree with the mathematical predictions. That's exactly what happened with Kennedy and Thorndike, and the results did not agree with the theory. But a very clever scientist, Albert Einstein, who did groundbreaking work on Brownian motion and who won a Nobel Prize for work on the photoelectric effect, came to the rescue. Abandoning the physical reasoning of Lorentz's relativity and just keeping the mathematics behind the physical reasoning, abracadabra, Einstein's special theory of relativity, in which the ether was banished from existence. Marvellous idea. Now, experiments like Thorndike and Kennedy's can't disprove it since it's not tied to the ether or anything else. Most of the world's scientists were delighted. Einstein's theory proved that you can't prove anything in the universe to be stationary or moving. And that includes the Earth. Some of the honest ones admitted they didn't understand it. Some considered it pure fraud. Viscount Samuel likened Einstein's version of relativity to the grin of the Cheshire cat in Alice in Wonderland, which remained behind when the cat had vanished. Frederick Soddy, in his address to Nobel Prize winners, noted that to get the required answers, relativity needed a fiddle factor, the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. He pointed out that if a schoolboy were to cook his figures to get the answer right, he would be held up to obloquy by the whole school and probably spanked. But instead, he noted the scientists of the day all tending to represent the mathematician, a mere calculator apart from experimental knowledge, as a heaven-sent magician able to make length and time physically equivalent. He also pointed out, whilst there is no objection urged against mathematicians doing whatever seems good to them in their own sphere, quite definitely they should be stopped from presenting their whims as science, let alone pretending that in the last analysis 
they are the real scientists. He warned us that the really dangerous liars in the world today are the mathematicians, if you are fool enough to believe them. Einstein didn't do experiments, except what he called thought experiments, which are all thought and no experiment. All his work was purely mathematical. To decide whether two events happened at the same time, he invented a complex and strange definition. To justify this, in his book Relativity, the Special and the General Theories, he wrote, It is in reality neither a supposition nor a hypothesis about the physical nature of light, but a stipulation which I can make of my own free will in order to arrive at a definition of simultaneity. So here we see the power of the heaven-sent magician. He doesn't need to bother about the reality of the real world. In his mathematical world, he can decree how things work. But he also tells us why he needs the definition. He hides the last part of what he's saying behind technical jargon, I've simplified his language just a bit so anyone can understand it. Owing to the alteration in direction of the velocity of revolution of the Earth in the course of a year, the Earth cannot be at rest throughout the whole year. However, the most careful observations have never revealed any trace of movement. This is a very powerful argument in favour of the principle of relativity. Oh, really? Why? Well, using his definition about how light works, he can conclude that you can't tell whether anybody in the universe is really moving or not. So, in Einstein's mathematical universe, just because all the most careful observations say the Earth is not moving, that doesn't mean it's standing still. The secular human scientists of the world choose to live in the mythomagical world of Einstein's mathematics. Gazing at the grin of the Cheshire cat after the cat has disappeared. So they can carry on believing in an earth hurtling around the sun at more than a hundred thousand kilometers an hour. But if anyone has doubts about the soundness of their reasoning, I suggest you take a look at what the creator of the universe has to say about the universe he created. In Job 26 verse 7 he tells us, He hangs the earth on nothing. That doesn't suggest it's hurtling around the sun at an enormous speed. Neither does Psalm 93, verse 1. The world also established that it cannot be moved. But regarding the sun, we read in Psalm 19, verses 5 and 6, that it rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of the heaven and its circuit to the other end and there is nothing hidden from its heat. That says the sun has a circuit around which it races. Elsewhere in the Bible, we see that the stars move in their courses, but there's no suggestion that the earth has a circuit or a course of any kind. So perhaps we ought to ask ourselves which possibility most reasonably fits what we saw last time and which Einstein confirmed this time that not a trace of movement of the earth can be detected by the most careful measurements. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.